On behalf of Mahatma Gandhi Peace Council of Ottawa, it gives me great pleasure to invite you, uh, to welcome you to the fourth annual N.P. Gandhi Lecture in Peace and Humanities, entitled Ahimsa, A Way of Life, A Path to Peace, to be delivered by Professor Hope Fitz of Eastern Connecticut State University. I would now like to invite Dr. Shane Hawkins, the Director of the College of Humanities, to welcome everyone. Hey, yeah. On behalf of the college, uh, let me thank you all for coming. Uh, allow me to welcome you. It's our great honor to welcome you here for this event. Uh, this is the fourth annual Gandhi Lecture, uh, and we're so happy to be able to have this endowed lecture uh, in the college. I would also like to thank those whose generosity has made this annual event possible. Uh, and I want to welcome Professor Fitz here to Ottawa. Uh, a rainy autumn day, perhaps not how we would like you to remember our city, but perhaps conducive to spending some time uh, thinking about what Gandhi had to say and, and thinking about what you're going to say uh, this afternoon to us. So welcome to all. I would now like to invite Dr. Jagmohan Kumar, Distinguished Research Professor of Engineering Emeritus and also the founding president of Mahatma Gandhi Peace Council of Ottawa to please come and invite our speaker today. Good afternoon. Uh, let me also add my welcome to you uh, on behalf of both the uh, Mahatma Gandhi Peace Council and Carlson University. It's a, a privilege and a pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Dr. Hope Fitz is a professor of philosophy at Eastern Connecticut State University. She obtained her PhD from Claremont Graduate School, of, uh, school specializing in Asian and comparative philosophy. And her PhD dissertation was on intuition as an integral process of the mind, which is one of our areas of research. And it, that uh, thesis provided a comparison of the views of Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan and Martin Heidegger uh, on their philosophies. Dr. Fitz's research and teaching interests include comparative philosophy, Gandhi studies and studies of Ahimsa, ethics, peace, and human rights. She is passionate about her intellectual interests and has been voted as an outstanding professor several times during her tenure uh, as a professor. For the last 22 years, Dr. Fitz has been doing research, writing articles, and presenting talk on Ahimsa. She is a prolific writer and a widely recognized speaker, as evidenced by her publications and presentations. And they embrace two books, five book chapters, over 50 abstracts, and articles, over 40 papers presented at professional meetings. She has lectured in many parts of the world, including United States, India, Europe, and China, among others. Her first book was on intuition, the nature and uses in human experience. Her latest book, published in 2015, is entitled Ahimsa, A Way of Life, A Path to Peace which is also the title of our presentation this afternoon. She is currently working on a book that will deal with ancient Greece and in ancient India, a comparison of their philosophies and their cultures. Dr. Fix is the recipient of many awards, research grants, and fellowships, and has presented several keynote lectures and major addresses, which include, among others, the 2007 inaugural address in the Gandhi Lecture Series of Indic Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth. In 2006, Dr. Pierce spent two months in India to study Jainism and its concepts of Ahimsa. And she has been to India many times before and after that. The Jain values of Ahimsa are nonviolence, anekant, or multiple aspects of reality, and therefore respect for another point of view, and aparigraha. That means self-restraint and moderation had a strong influence in Gandhi's life and his thoughts. At the conclusion of the Jain studies in India, Dr. Fitz uh, presented eight different talks at cities across India 
on the topics of Ahinsa. Dr. Fitz brings an enlightened perspective on Gandhian thought and a value that was dear to Gandhi, namely Ahinsa or nonviolence. The M.K. Gandhi lectures have been delivered by very distinguished scholars, researchers, and intellectuals. And Dr. Fitz maintains that tradition. And the title today, as you said, uh, what I saw was that Ahimsa is a way of life, and for her it is indeed a way of life. Uh, for a long time now, she has been a vegetarian. She practices what she preaches. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Hope Fitz. Ahimsa is about 4,000 years old, so there's not a whole lot that I can do in 45 minutes, uh, but I will try to hit certain highlights. How this began, and uh, the beautiful people, in my view, three giants who lived the life, Mahavir, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, and Gandhi. And uh, then I will come forward, because what's important to me, and I think to you, is not so much the past except to understand it. I think that we need to go forward. We need all of us to be active. Now, the giants of whom I am so fond, who lived this life more closely than anyone, this beautiful life of Ahimsa, they don't like some of Gandhi's terms or my terms. I, I'm Gandhian in that way, I'm talking about fighting. And maybe we could say active. We need to be more active, all of us. This is a troubled world. Oh my goodness. And you know what those of us in the United States are facing right now. I know you know. Oh, my goodness. So I think that let's touch, because we have so little time, let's touch upon the past and then come forward and then pick up Gandhi's life and what was important for him. And then come to today, what can we do? I wrote an article in the uh, uh, New Delhi newspaper, the Times of New Delhi, in which I said I was a Satyagrahi, a modern day one, and I am. I'm willing to do whatever I need to do to reduce this violence that we see in relationships, in the family, in the community, in the state, in the nation, in the world. And I think we all have to be active, every single one of us. So how do we do this? Well, first let's go back, back, back in time. I think I'm as far as I know, one of the few people who's worked with the origins of Ahimsa. And where we find it, it's just beautiful. Where you find it is in the Raja Veda and the Atharva Veda. They're first. And believe it or not, they're talking about justice. Justice? Back then. And this is much older than we thought. We used to say, when I was studying at Claremont Graduate School, we'd say, oh, you know, 1500 B.C. for the Rig Veda. Uh-uh, no. One of my neighbors has, uh, he knows Sanskrit and the old the Vedic Sanskrit. 1900 B.C.E. Mm. So this is old, old, old. So we want to look at this and say, well, what were they talking about? Well, they talked about a daughter and son being respectful of a parent, of a sister and brother, 
showing love and kindness to one another. They talked about community. They talked about um, lowering this himsa, himsa harm, injury, um, violence. So they were on to something. And they also talked about one who exploits. I always wonder, I just cannot stand when a person exploits other people. And when I think about it, Gandhi wrote about it. He actually said he thought maybe it was the worst thing. Exploitation. So these early people are writing about this. And they're like, wow. So, all right. Now, something that just kind of hit me over the head not long ago. It's funny how you work with something for years and years, over 20 years. And then a kind of light comes in. I'm thinking, geez, you know, this, this ahimsa, this, this is so powerful. And uh, the people were getting a handle on it pretty early on. And they understood how we had to come together and how we had to overcome the harm, the violence, all of it. And yet we go on century after century, country after country, war, mayhem, all of this. And I'm thinking, good grief, you know, why didn't we pick it up? I'll tell you something you may not have thought of. It took me forever to think like this, because I'm a comparative philosopher, and I so should have internalized this long ago, that in that beautiful subcontinent of India, this is where it started. And this is where it was contained. Hindus, Jains, Buddhists. Now the Hindus did allow, and still allow, darn, I wish they didn't, the uh, sacrifice of animals. And they would allow killing if it were against the king, if it were against uh, the country, you could go to war. The Jains have never had a war. Uh, the Jains and Buddhists said, no, no killing, not for any reason. So this is important, really important. Ahimsa says getting stronger now. The strongest statement of it is the Jains. And I tell my students, don't you ever tell me that people are just basically violent. Oh, no, they're not. Your Jains are not violent. They have never been violent. They will go to any end not to be violent. So, let's come forward in time. Patanjali, oh, what a great thinker. Oh, it's one of my favorite books in the whole world. The Yoga Sutra. And uh, when you understand it, when you've read it and read it and read it and read it and reread it, you begin to think, oh my goodness, this is fabulous. And it's written 500 to 200 BCE. And I think there's no question it predates Jain and Buddhist texts, although he's fighting Buddhists when he writes some of it. So there's an overlap. But uh, Patanjali, he says wisely, hmm, what causes people to harm one another? What causes that? Well, says he, it seems that there's this ragas in the vessel. Now, ragas is when we want to pull those people and ideas close to us who feed this ego. <coughs> now, think about it. Donnie's right. We do it almost every single one of us. It's when we draw those people and ideas close to us that feed that ego. Uh, but that's a is when you push those people and ideas away and you're willing to harm them if they threaten you. 
the core. We've got the core of it. Now we're doing the philosophical work. We haven't seen that before, but we're seeing it now. He's analyzing it. What causes this harm? Why? And then he sets out the beautiful steps of self-realization for a yoga. Of how, in the beginning, we have to have a himsa. And this belongs to uh, a restraint of the self, of the ego, of getting in touch with ourselves. It's a moral level. I used to think, why is he starting this at a moral level? Of course he's starting this at a moral level. Where else are you going to start it? So he starts at a moral level, and he says the base of all of it. And then he starts talking about how uh, we have to live, and it's pretty much, you see the same kind of thing, even more beautifully expressed, I will say, and completely expressed by the giant five principles. I love their aparigraha. I'm like, oh, I buy too many clothes, I do that, I have too many things. And if you have too many things, you get focused too much on the self, and you resist other people, and you've got to protect them, and you may have to even fight people over all the stuff you've got. I've got too much stuff, and I've got to work on it. So that I see in the giant text. But in this early, early work uh, of Patanjali, he's on to the same things, how we have to have ahimsa in our hearts and our minds, how we don't hurt other people with language, gossiping, idle things we say that can hurt people deeply, deeply, as we know. Uh, things that are thoughtless that we say. Think about the things we've said to our loved ones. Let's stop that. Things we wish we could take back. Just think about it. Things we wish we could take back. All right, then the spiritual. I'm not going to go into that now because there's a whole lot to all these religions. After all, they're huge. So, uh, and been around a long, long time. So let's say, okay, uh, we understand the spiritual, the, the ahimsa, the working on the moral self, the working on the spiritual self, and that's not quite what you might take it to be here. It's very hard for a, a yoga. Oh my goodness. It has to do with cleanliness inside, outside. Learning to be strong and being able to get up in the morning when it's maybe five or six o'clock and go in a river to bathe. It's, have you got the middle? Have you got the stuff? So that's, that's another one. Now we start out with what all of us understand yoga to be. Here it is, perhaps for the first time ever, written in a way that it's laid out clearly. All right, we have to work with the body. We have to be able to uh, get this body in shape so that we can meditate. Now, he was never big Patanjali on any particular form like I and Vega and those who thought we had to you know, be a pretzel, none of that. But you have to be able to concentrate. And we don't do enough of it in the Western world. It's really important that we meditate. Get outside of this world and all its noise. Get inside. I think this is a huge path to peace. All right, then next uh, he says, all right, now we have to breathe. And I used to scoff at things, oh, Mr. Pete, sometimes I could kick myself, things I thought weren't important, and then I realized later, of course, that oxygen is getting to the brain. They knew what they were doing. Who are you talking to myself? If you think this isn't important, this is the key. You learn to breathe this way as a snare, not this way. Tremendous power. Tremendous. All right. Now, a decision. 
on our part to shut off this blasted noise of the world, which works, I've never seen such a time, I never dreamed we'd have such a time. Noise everywhere. We're going to shut it out. This is the beginning of our meditation. Okay, how do we do that? Well, it isn't easy. Turn off the radio, turn off voices, have a time where you're alone, that you meditate in your way, quietly. Start going inside. It isn't always easy, but you can do it. You can do it. I had a woman, head of the Fedanta Society. Her husband died, and there was no one to take it over in California. Can you imagine a woman Fedanta? She taught us how to meditate. Now, here are your biggies. This is yoga proper. The other is not yoga proper. This is yoga. All right. Dharana. This means that we are focused upon one thing. It could be an object or a subject, but it's one thing. And we have to work at it really, really diligently so that we're focused. Now, second step, Diana. There is only in your conscious state you and what you're focusing upon. That's all. Nothing else. And the Hindus believe it goes like that. Third step, samadhi. One. Reality. Now, many textbooks act as if that's the end of the story. It isn't. Not at all. Read that yoga sutra. I just love it. Samyama. You put all three together, and now we're in a different state. I've written a book, as you said, about intuition. Now, I don't agree with everything that, that's said, but I don't reject it either. I keep an open mind, but I certainly know that intuition works, and it's powerful, and we haven't developed it in the United States the United States, partly because we didn't trust the scholastics after that whole scholastic period. And we're so, you know, above and beyond everything, we won't look at many things. Well, they looked in India. Powerful, powerful, powerful. There are many things that these yogins could do that are just unbelievable. You've read about them. I don't know whether people can levitate, but I almost made up my mind that was impossible when I read that one of my heroes, I think it was Sri Aurobindo, was in prison. And he felt as if his body were being elevated. And he's one of my heroes, so I thought he would never lie. So I don't know, but I do know that they believe that at this level, intuition is so powerful that we can see into the past and into the future, as well as the present. And in the Hindu tradition, it's more like there's a torch in here, inside. And when we overcome the material and the physical world after many, many lifetimes, that torch shines into reality. That's the basic Hindu belief. Okay, so let's leave that go forward. Now, these wonderful giants, I can't say enough, and I could talk for hours about them, having spent two months with them in uh, India in 2006, with Anne Vallely, whom many of you know. Uh, we, it was just wonderful, just wonderful. And she taught me how to get little frogs out of the dorm where we were staying, how to get bugs out without hurting them. Little things, big things, I was learning all kinds of things. And I teach my students, don't leave a, a poor caterpillar on the step if it's hot. Take something and lift that caterpillar. And at first they look at me like, oh gee, she's nuts. And then after a while, there's kind of a smile on their faces. And then they get quiet. Oh, they're so quiet. They like it. They really 
like this. We need to get to the students and the children. That's where our aim is. That's where our power lies. That's where we can change things away from people like Trump and his selfishness. Well, it's true. To people who care. Because the other side of this ahimsa, now Buddha did the best job on this, the compassion, although I'm not sure anymore that most Buddhists can do it, but he did it. He said, if you have true compassion, you could never hurt anything. And I thought, he's right. If you had true compassion, how could you hurt anything? So bells went off. All right, now let's think about this wonderful, wonderful person, Gandhiji. And I say that with the greatest affection. I have never revered anyone the way I do him. And he is not a saint and he would not want us to make him one. He would be upset with us if we try to deify him, as people try to deify him. Buddha. Buddha said, I'm not a, a god, but he was deified. Gandhi would say, please, you must find your way. But this beautiful person was born in 1869, on the 2nd of October, today. I've got goosebumps. And he wasn't perfect. Come on, throw that perfection noise out the window. I can't stand it. This child had problems. Those of you know, who know about his life, he was married at 13. And we think, oh my god, 13. But that was common then. And the children went into the home of the uh, husband's family. So it wasn't the way we think of it. But Gandhi was jealous of his wife, and he, uh, he had done a few things when he was young, but what a beautiful father he had. He stole something, and a couple times he stole things, and he saw a tear in his father's eye. And he said, I couldn't stand it. He never did that again in his entire life. This young man learned, and painfully shy. I've never been shy in my whole life. I could talk to 10,000 of you if I were prepared. I've never been shy. My daughters are. They say they are. But he was painfully shy. A small man. Small only in stature. A giant. Absolute giant. And slowly, slowly, you could say, okay, it's situational. I think it happened Martinsburg that night when he was thrown off the train. I remember being in India many times when we gave uh, a piece of paper and, you know, we had bought the tickets outside and come in and uh, they're looking at him and he's in first class and what are you doing? A colored person in first class, he says, well, I want a ticket. And they said, oh, you couldn't buy a ticket. Well, I did. He says, here, here's my card. I'm a lawyer. Oh, no. No colored people are, are lawyers. Well, he says, he never missed a beat. Those of us that know Gandhi, that he is the sharpest thinker in practical things you've ever met, and he's on the mark. He said, well, I must be one because you think I'm dark. And you say that, uh, you know, here I am, and I'm on this, here's my card. So they threw him off. And I think that night something happened. I really do. I think that when he was cold in Africa for the first time, South Africa, and there he is, lonely and cold with his suitcase. He's never been there before. He's a shy person. How would you feel? Then he gets down to South Africa, 
and wonder of wonders, persecution is going on. So those of you that have seen the movie know a lot about, that was a well done movie. Some things were brought together that really happened separately. But the beautiful time when you were shown when he's standing there, he's not very big, and he's on that platform, and you know how they was old, they're like old opera houses. They go way, way up. And all these people in there, angry. Well, they had a right to be angry. The Hindus and the Muslims were just, oh, treated like dirt. You know, having to have these passes everywhere they went, not being able to have the same privileges, slowly being put down, 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 where uh, they were considered uh, some kind of a, I don't want to say vermin, but you would walk on the other side of the street rather than walk with them. It was that bad. So there he is in the midst of all that, and what does he do? He fights. Now I know, I'm sorry you Chinese. <laughs> I know you don't like that, but I'm a fighter. I've got courage and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to fight. And I don't mean violently. I mean non-violently. I'll fight for, not against, not to hurt, not at all. He never did. But to teach. Okay. So, what does he do? Well, he begins to put himself together. He begins to think, hmm, I'm going to figure out this way of what I call fighting. And uh, it's called satyagraha. Satya, truth. Graha, to take hold of. So he's got an active resistance. But I wouldn't even like the word resistance. That, to me, something has to push you. No, I think he was on board and knew what was coming. But I also love the fact he let people know. He never just suddenly did something surprising or put people on edge. He let them know, we're going to protest. And when he began, we were not expected for him as Satyagrahis. You were not expected to uh, protest physically, you could uh, sit down or, or refuse to take part in something. That was fine. But in the beginning, he wanted that to be an option. Later, it's going to be much more than that, as India goes forward. Now, I have to tell you a little story, and you can please keep track of my time, because I can talk to you all night. Uh, I was with my friend Usha Takar, I'm going to leave one of the books uh, with you for your library. And Usha's, oh, she's so beautiful. She is the uh, honorable director of the Gandhi Research Institute in Mumbai. And she told me, she said, oh, she said, come in this room. She said, he slept here often. And then she said, look out there. That's where the freedom gliders fall. I just thought, oh my gosh, what have we been given to be there? So uh, he had an ability, once he realized it, to garner people because he spoke truth. He hated lying, not just telling falsehoods, but also deception of any kind. He hated it. So when people heard him, they knew he spoke truth. Can you imagine his old jailer in South Africa bringing him back the sandals that that man had made for him? That's reverence. I don't think anyone has ever on this earth been loved as he. And the more people that know about him, the more that will love him. Now, what did he say? And I say the same thing about himself. Someone was asking him, well, what religion are you? Well, yes, he was born a Hindu. But as you Jains know, he was more influenced by the Jains almost than the Hindus. And he was Buddhist too, because he brought the ideas of Ahimsa together. 
and I'll tell you what they are in just a minute. He's going to put them arm in arm and love together. But this beautiful person lived this life, even though you can imagine it must have been very painful and very difficult to correct yourself, to bring yourself to, to task, to not flare out at people, to not uh, want to hurt back. The only thing that you could say that was hard, and my students would have a hard time with this one because they don't understand it, but he thought that if we practiced ahimsa, even in a battle, and he was in many of them, when the, the people would march together with no arms, as they did in the salt march, he believed that it shamed the other people who were perpetrating the offense, the harm. And I think that kind of shame is good for people. Not where you would hit a child over the head with shame, shame, shame. I don't believe in that. But I believe that if we teach people there are things they should be ashamed of. Harming another, hurting another, bashing people. This was terrible. But I think it was probably one of the greatest nights in the whole world when that reporter from the Times, oh, that's true, in the movie, when he called the Times and he said, it's over. India will be her own country. It's just a matter of time. He said the English are so ashamed of what they've done. This beautiful person persisted. Okay, now, forward. All right, now, uh, let's go forward to now, because I don't have much time. I'd love to talk to you for hours, but we don't have much time. What about today? What can we do? Well, I had some ideas, and I'd love to hear your ideas, and I wish you'd write to me. You can write to me at the university. I. I've tried to pluck the best I can from what I think he might say today, how we should live. I'll just give you a few highlights of things I've written in the book. And please, it's not exhaustive. That's why it's small. I did this deliberately. So you can add, you can tell me things you think that we can do today, living today. So the kind of thing that I hit on, I, I thought, the, and I remembered other philosophers too, and so doing, Confucius and his idea of the family, and teaching respect, and respect goes to those in authority, and uh, how important it is that we have this sense of respect and family. It's just beautiful. So I put some of that, and then I put some of Aristotle and other things, but just us, I was thinking, okay, um, what are the things that we can do to make things better? Well, I would think one thing is not to make religious or cultural boundaries so tight that we can't get across to others. Does that make sense? To try harder? to get across to all people, whether they're the same as we, especially if they are. And try to understand, try so hard to understand. And don't judge till you do understand. And don't judge harshly, harshly. And then I think little things. What about teaching the children to help the neighbors down the street? Maybe there's a, a, an elderly woman or man who can't do the yard. Don't you think we should give them a little more responsibility than we have? What do you think? In general, does it sound good? Have them help out. No, you might say, well, it's dangerous. We don't know the neighbors. Then let's get to know our neighbors. Does that make sense? Try to get to know some of our neighbors. Have those children involved? 
have them doing for others from when they're very young. Teach them that. Teach them to care for one another, as it said in the ancient Rajaveda, a sister and a brother. They should show each other love and respect. Now these things sound simple, don't they? But I think this is what's missing. And why, part of why we're in the mess we're in. This violence, Gandhi always said, violence begets violence. And it does. It does. So little things that we can do. Mend the rifts in our families and our friends. We all have them, right? Mend them if we can. And try as much as we can to speak with soft voices, not, not harsh. And not, Gandhi sometimes was very, very firm with people. He was no pushover at all. But he wasn't putting people down. He was never condescending, ever. So let's not be condescending with our students, our employees, the people in our homes, everywhere we are. Not with each other, especially not with each other. I lost two great loves, and this book is dedicated to them and my daughter. They both died. And one of them led me to where I am today. I think his, well, I know his ancestors were Quakers. And I don't know much about the Quakers. I intend to learn more. But the love that was shown in his family, and no violence, and yet they were activists. They were involved. They always had it. So we can do both. And this man was so gentle and so kind and so wonderful. Here he was, director two at the probation department in Southern California. He said, I don't dare let them know how gentle I am. They won't understand it. Now, is that an awful thing? Think about it. I don't dare let them know how gentle I am. They won't understand it. Strength. Force. <sighs> Fooey. I'm a fighter, but not that kind of fighter. That doesn't get you anywhere. Violence begets violence. And I think it takes more guts, real guts, to be nonviolent than what I call a fighter, or you might say an activist, than it does to be the fighter. You're going in unarmed. Right? So I think we it's about time for questions, right? Have we got have I got more time? Oh, oh goody. All right. So let's see some of the things that I think that we could think about. And I want to hear your thoughts on it too. So please be thinking about them. Again, teaching children to, to help instead of harm others. And uh, showing the proper care and respect when a family or friend is dying. I think I've seen some things that are pretty ugly, and I guess you have to people like vultures after there's been a death because of the material things left. Never walk away from it. Ugh, no. Uh, things that we can do and say to help others, remembering the little things. I really would rather turn this over and have people ask me questions now, because I think that they have a lot on their <coughs> minds, and they have some ideas too, and we should get their ideas about how we can, uh, all of us, do better in this thing of ahimsa, take it into our everyday lives. Speak softly. Don't be, if, even if you're irritated, turn it down. Now I'm trying so hard, but my beautiful dog, see my dog? He's huge. 
He's a great Pyrenees, and he's got a horrible, horrible allergy. And uh, he's losing a lot of his hair, so every four hours I have to give him a Benadryl, and then he's on a special diet, and you know all about it. Alex knows all about it. He's a former student who's now going to school in Canada. And it's just, I've got to learn ahimsa. I've got to practice it. It's not learn it, it's practice it every day. I've got to be patient with him. He can't help but that he's scratching. He's miserable. And we, we, he's going to a wonderful physician. Well, she's a vet, but she, she's a holistic vet. And she used to be a regular vet. But she's doing everything humanly possible to get chemicals out of his body. That's another story we can go into. I think they're dangerous, a lot of them. But anyway, I got to learn to act on what I believe. How often have our students told us, told us, walk the talk? It's so important. We can talk till we're blue in the face. Who cares? Hmm? We've got to live it. OK, I want to hear what you've got to say, and I'll try to answer any of your questions and whatever. So who wants to 